I'm Karen Webster, and welcome to the Payments.com digital discussion today on enabling the digital economy. First, a little context to get us all in the right frame of mind. So it's been said that money makes the world go round. And of course, we know this to be true since it was one of the most popular songs from the wildly successful Broadway musical Cabaret, sung famously by Liza Minnelli. But, but seriously, it's of course true that money is the lubricant of our global economy. And moving it faster, better, more securely, and cheaper is something that payments innovators worldwide are driven to improve. Because quite literally, moving money anywhere between two people who wish to split the dinner check by the insurance company that wants to send one of their insured's money for the payment of a claim by a software platform like Uber that wants to pay its drivers is quite complicated. It's complicated because what's required to remain compliant when money is moved between two people and businesses, especially cross-border. It's complicated because the structure of payments infrastructure was built at a time when how we moved money was very different and when payments was very much an analog business. It's complicated because today the world is anything but that. And consumers are not only moving at the speed of digital, but they are digital. And their expectations of how money is moved now isn't measured in days or weeks, but hours and minutes. And that puts pressure on businesses they interact with to follow suit. So that's what we're here to discuss today, how to move money at the speed of digital to enable the many opportunities that the digital economy that isn't just coming, but is already here will enable. So I'm delighted today to be joined by two experts on the topic, Tammy Shapiro, Vice President, Product Management and Strategy at Fiserv, and Paul Diegelman, Vice President, ePayments and Partnership, also at Fiserv. Hey guys, thanks for joining me today. Hey Karen. So did you guys want to break out in song? Do you know the song track I refer to in Cabaret? You know, I've, I've never been part of something where I've been compared to Liza Minnelli, so this is a real first. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you never know what you're going to get on these digital discussions, so here you go. But, um, but I, I think it's an important topic, and I, you know, I, I wanted to, to put it in the context of the fact that it is a complicated thing to do, even though it sounds so simple. Um, but moving money is a serious business, and, and it's always been serious, but consumer expectations are taking it to, a, to another level. So, 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 Paul, maybe I can start with you uh, a little bit in, in, in giving us some background about, speaking of moving money, uh, how much you move. Yeah, sounds good, Karen. We agree with you. Moving money is a serious business, and there is a tremendous amount of infrastructure that's required in order to, to meet consumer expectations and, and the expectations of the businesses that they may be interacting with. And so, you know, many people on this call and, and certainly in the financial services and the payments market probably know Fiserv pretty well. But for those that don't, we have tremendous scale in digital money movement and enterprise risk management um, that, that we put to play to successfully help consumers and businesses send or receive or manage their money. And for the folks who haven't heard of us, it's, it's likely we already work together through your bank or through the companies that you pay or through the people who may pay you. Because for example, last year, Fiserv moved over $75 trillion across 30 billion digital payments. Things like person to person, you know, to your reference about splitting the dinner check or business to consumer to, to your reference about insurance claims. Um, and certainly consumers paying businesses digitally, which is one of significant growth pattern. So it's the sort of scale and perspective that we bring to money movement uh, in the digital economy that we'll talk about here today. That sounds, that sounds great, Paul, and I think that's a, that's a good context. Um, that level of money movement provides a, a lot of interesting best practices and insights about what, what it takes to actually Make it happen effectively in this digital world, T Tammy. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it to you to to give us a little context about the movement of money as we just talked about between consumers and businesses. P 
put it in a little bit of context that, that's real for us. Sure, Karen, thank you. So yeah, so like you said, um, when you just kicked off, I, I guess I would start by saying the way that consumers and businesses are paying and want to get paid has, has changed significantly and continues to change. And that's why we're seeing checks have gone down significantly. We're seeing all sorts of new payments that are emerging uh, pretty much all the time. Um, I think it's helpful to think about the way money moves. So there's consumers that are paying businesses uh, for all sorts of things. And at the same time, there are businesses that pay consumers, maybe for not as many use cases, but there's still a lot. It can be uh, claims payments or merchants paying out rebates or loan disbursements, earned wages. There's a lot of money that moves from businesses to consumers. Uh, I, I think there's a few common themes, and, and you mentioned some of these, Karen. So it needs to be easy, it needs to be safe, and it needs to be fast. And, and you mentioned cheaper, and I think that's another important one, the, the cost of, of, of how the money moves. Um, when it comes to easy, consumers don't want to have to provide excessive information. Um, they want to be able to pay the, the way they want to pay. Uh, if it's something where they're paying um, on a repeating basis, they don't want to have to continue to enter the same information over and over again. Um, security and safety is also important. They don't want to compromise their personal information, their financial information. And then speed, so when a consumer is paying a business, they want to know that that business has been paid, especially if it's, for example, a bill. You want that confirmation that the money's there and that whatever you owe is, is settled. Um, the business, on the other hand, also wants that. They, they want to get their money fast. They want to know that the money's good so that they can offer the service or the, the good that the consumer's buying. Um, on the flip side, we know that businesses also pay consumers for some of the, the reasons that I mentioned. And I think just like, um, just like their, their customers, from a consumer perspective, um, they want it to be easy to get paid. Their customers want it to be easy for them to collect the money that they're due. They want it now. In some cases, they may even need it now. So I mentioned insurance claims as an example. If there's a natural disaster or some sort of emergency, the option for the money to, to arrive slowly, to arrive by mail, can, can present a significant challenge for the consumer. Um, if, if we look at the next slide, I thought it'd be interesting to talk about some metrics that um, that that we and, and there's a lot of metrics out in the industry on this, I would say. But Pfizer, uh, we've we've conducted our own research. We have a consumer trend survey that we do regularly, and one of the questions that we ask consumers is whether they would prefer to receive an electronic payment over a check. Um, overall, over half of consumers did, which I think is a meaningful number, and I think. If you dig a little bit deeper and look at some of the demographics, um, we found that 77% of millennials preferred to receive an electronic payment. Um, Two-thirds of urban consumers preferred an electronic payment. So these are key demographics. Um, and I would also say that in a lot of cases, these demographics are a little less forgiving. So, so they'll, they'll go to the business that can provide them with the service that best meets their needs. Um, one of our partners, Visa, also did a study. This was very specific to claim payments, but they found that 89% of consumers would prefer to, to receive um, their payments um, to their debit card, electronically to their debit card. And receiving it electronically to their debit card actually means that they're going to receive the money in real time or in near real time because the money moves almost instantly in that scenario. Um, yeah, I, I if we go, there's a... So, so just, 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 on that, just on that point, a, co a couple of comments, and I think the... I think the one reason that you know debit card is so important is that it's easy for a consumer to access. So, so, so not so easy uh, to actually have to find a check and read all the information on a check. But a debit card is something that consumers have have handy. So, so does eliminate that that friction. Um, I, I'm curious though. Um, do you think that this is just a millennial thing, or do you think that everyone now is expecting? payments to just be faster. I mean, you take a check because it's, it's what you get, but, you know, nobody likes right. it and they don't really, you know, they don't really want them anymore. I completely agree. I almost feel like the, the millennial and, and younger demographics, I would almost say they expect it. Like, they don't understand right. why, why it can't be that way. Whereas other demographics, I would say, strongly prefer it, but maybe they're a little more used to receiving checks, so it's, it's not... Um, maybe as critical or as top of mind, but I, I completely agree that it's not something that I would focus on a, a specific demographic. It's more so that when we do the research, we, we, we tend to see that millennials and, and younger demographics have that much more of a preference, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, it, it does. And, and Tammy, just to clarify, are, these are U.S. statistics, correct? These are, yes. U.S. consumers, okay. So, so you mentioned, um, you mentioned, you know, I'd rather be electronic uh, or, or switch. Give us some color commentary around this slide. Yeah, so this, and this is interesting um, with the comment that you just made around people have debit cards on hand, so, um, so that makes it very easy for them to provide that information, which I completely agree with. Um, we, we did some research recently looking at how consumers pay businesses. And what we tested specifically and what this is showing is we asked consumers who were currently actually using checks if they had the option to pay with their bank account, right, which means adding in their, their bank account information. If they had that option, would they move away from using checks to paying through ACH and paying digitally? And I think it's interesting that we saw a pretty um, meaningful percentage of consumers said that they would. So if you just, just to give one example here, the way to read this is 28% of consumers who are currently using check to pay for rent or mortgage payments said that they would use what we called e-check um, if, if that option was available to them. And, and I, I mean, going back to the comment on debit card, I, I'm not suggesting that e-check is it's for everyone. We know that some yeah. people um, it, in the tanks are very loyal to their cards, right? So they want that. They want their rewards or whatever it might be. Um, but I think it, the, this research shows that um, their, the choice, right, having the option to pay with different ways is important. And I would also say that in, in this scenario and in some of these use cases, some of the businesses don't or institutions don't accept cards today because of the cost. And so some consumers are like, well, even if they prefer a card, the option to pay um, digitally through another method is preferred over having to rely yep. on check. Yeah, yeah, no, I think, I think it's a good point. I also think it may be different if a consumer is expecting payment versus making a payment. I, you know, I, I think, I think it, 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 it may be slightly nuanced there. I'm actually surprised that these are so low. I mean, I can't believe that, you know, 70% of people would still rather write a check to pay their mortgage. Really, good grief. Yeah, I, I, I don't. I mean, I, these are numbers that we, from a very recent study we did earlier yeah, no, I this year. I, I agree with you, though, that um, this is a meaningful number, right, to be able, as a business, yeah. to say I can cut one-fourth or one-third or of my volume, move it away from paper, that's, that's meaningful progress. Um, but I agree, and, and in reality, um, I, I think to your point, we might see even greater movement, right, if, if, if this option was available as a, as a replacement for check. Yeah, and, and, I, and, I, and I think that's probably right. You know, in, in the real world, when that's prompted as an option, you know, people may, may be, be prompted to do, to do it even, even, even more. But, but I think the point is that um, what you're saying is that this, this requires, all of these inputs require new ways of thinking about payment. Exactly, exactly. Um, and I would say, I mean, one of the, so I, I think the good news um, is, is that a lot of companies are responding to, to, these, um, to these needs, right, or these consumer preferences or needs that we're seeing. And so if you look at traditional companies, I, I would say specifically looking at digital payments, they're probably not moving as fast as, as some new businesses, but but they are getting there, and they're looking for partnerships and, and, and leveraging payment, you know, payment platforms or payment process or payment services to actually ex help them expand or, in some cases, revamp their payment offerings, um, and, and largely because their, their customers are asking for it, right, and they are sensitive to the cost of check, and so they're looking for alternatives. I think it's an interesting contrast, though, when you look at some of the newer business models, so sharing economies. Um, you, mm -hmm. you gave the example of Uber. Um, Amazon, so digital subscription services are great examples. They really started digitally and they grew up in the digital space. And so when it comes to payments, it's almost like payments are really embedded in what they do, right? It is digital and it's just kind of part of the experience and it's, it, it's, it tends to be really seamless. So, so I would say in general, we're seeing, um, you know, there's still a lot of opportunity, there's still a lot of check in the, checks in the system, but we are seeing um, more and more momentum towards really embracing these, these digital payment alternatives. Yeah, I think there are also more tools available, which we'll, we'll talk about in just a minute. But a, a point of clarification, 
When you talk about digital payments, are you lumping digital wallets into that as a, as a method, or is digital defined differently as part of your survey? That was a question that came in. Um, so digital wallets would be included. So in, in the, the research I mentioned earlier, or at least around, um, well, I, I guess I, I would answer it two ways. So in terms of when, when we did the research around receiving a payment, it was really just not, it, was, it didn't specify a method. It was just more a general question around would you prefer to receive a payment digitally or would you, um, or would you prefer to receive a check? Um, in terms of making payment, um, I, I mean, I, I think digital wallets, you know, if, if check, digital wallets, digital wallets is an alternative to check um, is definitely a compelling alternative. I would say that the research that we, that I shared um, or that we were talking about previously was very specific to e-check. Um, so we were just looking at what people prefer to use their bank account. And so, so that, those Got numbers it. were specific to that. Got it. Okay, great. Thanks. So, so Paul, I'm going to, sure. I'm going to toss, I'm going to toss it over to you. Um, because I think that we've talked about the need. So let's talk about what has to happen because with all of this digital evolution, clearly there are things that have to be considered differently. So, I'm going to let you take the stage, but don't sing, okay. or, or, or you can sing if you want to, actually. <laughs> I've been working on my hair. It looks more like Liza Minnelli right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, here, we, we, we've talked about a little bit about the payments opportunity, right? So the, these are the characteristics in Fiserv's opinion that really define sort of the future of digital payments. and. We've talked already about consumers and their interest in speed and, and fast and things that move at what Fiserv calls the speed of life. You know, we're all very busy. We all have a lot of things going on in our lives. And, and we would like money to move in, a, in, as, in as frictionless a way as possible. Now, that said, jump to the right side. The security, the fraud, and the risk management are incredibly important because as payments move faster, the opportunity for fraudsters and others to create an unintended consequence goes up dramatically. And this is something that, that you know, go back to my number, uh, $75 trillion and 30 billion transactions. We are acutely focused on this sort of thing in terms of how do you make the experience work for everybody in the ecosystem without letting the unintended consequences of increased fraud or theft of, of identity or money, you know, those things really have to be carefully mitigated as speeds increase. And sort of the stuff in the middle, I think we've covered a little bit to some extent around support across payment types, whether it's card rails or ACH or some of the different flavors of P2P. And, you know, in the middle, users have to like to use these things. I mean, they do want speed, but they also want a user interface that they understand and it also works the way um, they work in their mind and the way they, they, they go about their day. So I think these are some of the, the important characteristics that companies need to focus on as they think about how best to move faster on behalf of themselves and their consumers. So, so a couple questions, Paul, before we, before we jump into the next topic. Um, you mentioned security and risk. I agree, it's, 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 it's absolutely critical. But, but what are the things that you're doing um, in order to make sure that, you know, particularly as we're talking about faster payments and money moving from a bank account to, to, to another bank account. What are you doing to make sure that that is, in fact, a legitimate transaction by an authenticated consumer? So one of the, one of the advantages of the work that we've been doing for 30 years is that our capabilities around uh, support for money transmission laws and compliance with the important regulations that exist in the, uh, in the U.S. financial system and uh, a, an understanding of the opinion and the preferences of the CFPB, those are the sort of things we do already. We've been doing them for banks and businesses for 30 years. And so, you know, w with, with the kind of flow through that we see, we're super focused on how do we protect our bank customers and how do we protect our consumer customers and how do we protect our business customers. And it, it's, a, it, it's a sophisticated and enterprise class operation that uh, takes all the inputs around how to do it right and then goes ahead and, and affects it in a, in a fairly fast and, uh, and thorough fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
expected. So I, I, would, I would imagine that that for you is table stakes, it has to be. Um, let's talk a little bit about, about some of the implications around, around the business models though, because I think that's often an interesting area to explore as new capabilities are, are, brought, into the, are brought into the fore for, for, for everyone to consider. What is your position and thinking on that? So when, when you say business models, tell me a little bit more. So if you're, if you're talking about, um, you know, using card rails versus ACH rails, um, you know, there, there are verticals where money with big dollar denominations are moving across, across a network. Um, so I think that introduces some, you know, business model questions about, about fees and pricing models and so forth. Okay, got it. You know, it, it does. And as a matter of fact, if you jump to the next slide, I think this helps to illustrate that, which is, you know, back to an earlier question or a statement you made about infrastructure. You know, one of the things that, that I think is a big challenge in a lot of the business models is that, and, and it's a challenge for banks and fintechs um, and virtually everyone moving to a faster payments model, is that there's not a single or a standardized path forward. So, you know, you've got the clearinghouse here, which is very dialed into business to business, um, significant dollar transactions that would move very quickly. You've got a number of others here, the, the legacy rails, the Visa and MasterCard, which move incredibly quickly. Um, and so, you know, when we look at money movement and the infrastructure, there's more infrastructure than there used to be, which impacts, you know, not only your, your question around different business models, but it also impacts what do these things cost to do? Um, how do people react to the pressure of, you know, my company needs to stitch into one of these rails or, or you know, and if I do it, what will it cost me and, and, and how do I do this? So what's happened is as business models have evolved and the underlying infrastructure has evolved or evolved, what's happened is there's more options and more options create pressure and friction and so one of the things that we've chosen to do to help these different business models, whether it's businesses or, or banks or consumers, if you, if you jump over to the next chart, is what we've done is layered on top of it uh, what we call the now network. And so if you look at this chart, on the left, you've got senders, and on the right, you've got receivers, and there's lots of ways for senders to get to, to the receivers. And so to, to your point, we built and introduced the NOW network to remove the friction in these payment encounters and to also, you know, to, to, to help the parties get together to move money at an appropriate cost point and at an appropriate speed that is sort of wrapped in an, in a, in an envelope of appropriate fraud and risk and security mitigants. So that, that connectivity and that inner interconnection, we think, streamlines the process for senders and receivers very confidently and helps them make the business case they want to make as they move from whatever model of, of sending money they have today to the, to the model that best suits their business going forward. Got it. So, so, so basically, you're making it easy for that integration to happen and that optionality to be available for, for the senders, those who are initiating the payment. It, it, yes, it, it does the same for the receiver. You know, the, the NOW network is a giant enabler because okay. there's so many choices of, of sender and receiver and the way they might get to each other today. I mean, only some of them are on the middle of that chart sort of grayed out. There's more. Um, and th there's just, you know, the, the beauty of options is that options are good. However, the downside to it is that it creates a lot of complexity and, and it makes things confusing for counterparties in a digital payment transaction, and that's what we're trying to do, enable that connectivity at the right speed, the right price, the right level of risk and fraud. The, um, I think this may come later, but it's a question that I, I think is actually quite interesting, and it is related to um, APIs and all of the uh, management of the infrastructure around enabling APIs now in an environment of multiple options and faster payments and a variety of payment methods. What are, how are you guys helping to lighten that load and can you share a few best practices perhaps on how you're doing that? Uh, Tam, you want me to start or you want to start? Um, 
if you want to go for it, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in after. Yeah, right on. So, so one of the things we've seen, Karen, is different business models have different technology and the implications of their technology. So you look at some of the traditional industries, let's say today, who are sending checks and want to move to digital. They often are not yet API capable. And you can contrast that to the newer organizations that have built out more contemporary platforms that, that were built with the construct of API native within that, within that architecture. And so it's incumbent on folks like us to be able to help enable businesses to be able to get to the rails no matter what their underlying infrastructure is like. You know, someday we'll all, we'll all do APIs, but we all don't do that today um, in, in the business landscape. So you know, I, I think that's another piece here of, of an enabling technology is that you really can't force down a one-size-fits-all when the business is sending um, so that you can, you can help get them into this ecosystem. Got it. Um, let's move on to the to the next slide, which I think puts um, some of the the construct of faster payments, which tends to be a label that the industry has put on, you know, a, a big bundle of of benefits that moving money more quickly offers. Maybe you could give us your spin on on what that's all about. Yeah, you know, I think removing the friction that we've been talking a little bit about helps businesses in a number of ways, and, and they're laid out on this chart. If, if we start at the top left, operating efficiency, you know, in, in many ways, moving from from something that, you know often paper based to something that is digital becomes an efficiency play, and. Below that, as I've referenced before, you absolutely got to focus on on the risk and the fraud component, and and it, it is manageable without a doubt. Um, but it takes some careful, uh, careful you know careful view and some competence to do it. And you know, there's another benefit often that we see with businesses who are sending, which is the consumer experience. You know, we've talked about consumers and the speed of life and the things they want to do, and, and digital absolutely lends itself there. You know, there may be a, an advantage in cash flow here. Um, it, it may be improved if the money moves faster or the money may not actually move faster, but businesses may have more time to plan and predict before they move the money uh, because ultimately the speed of the money, you know, the money itself moves faster once you, in fact, invoke that payment. So, you know, you could also look at this chart in more of a consumer-to-business model. You know, the consumer has more time to make a faster payment. You know, so if, if they needed to mail a check and it took three to five days, they could pay right now and it would post right now and all of a sudden they just picked up three to five days that, that they can use for themselves. And doing that not only gave them more time, but it probably improved the experience. So, that, you know, there's a, there, there's a lot of different ways to look at this chart, but it seems like when businesses and consumers can get stitched into a digital ecosystem like this, there are a number of advantages, and you know it's our job to help them figure out what those advantages are and whether they make a business case. What about the data aspect of of this, which I know um, concerns at least some players from the standpoint of being able to um, attach the right data elements to the money that's now moving more quickly. Yeah, the, um, you know, the, that tends to manifest itself an awful lot in business-to-business -business payments because the act of moving the money from one business to another is not particularly difficult. You know, there's all these rails we've talked about, and, and you leverage the now network and you smooth all that out. The, the, the real friction, I think, comes in in that the sending company needs to deliver to the receiving company the information that the receiving company can use to post this into their records on time and accurately reflect that the payment has been made, and yeah, that is that that is an area that continues to mature. I think it still is a it's a pretty significant blocker in in automating B two B payments, and I think right. that issue there is a reason why things like bank lock boxes, you know, wholesale lock box still exists wow. because that that problem has not been tackled, not to the degree that uh, you know a payment between a business and a consumer has been. So, so let's talk about. Um, insurance, which seems to be something we kind of keep keep uh, gravitating toward, uh, because I think it's such an interesting um, example of a use case business to consumer. Do you want to walk us through Lemonade, which is, by the way, a great way 
great name for a business. It's a happy name, don't you think? It's a happy name. Yeah, and, and Karen, I, I can give a little background on that. So, yeah, I do think the insurance industry, I mean, it's obviously one of many industries that are out there that are moving into digital payments. But I think it's a really interesting one because it's obviously, it's it's been around for a long time. There's a lot of legacy or traditional players that are out there. And it, it also tends to be a, a heavily regulated industry. And a lot of times with that regulation, um, companies can be a little slower to innovate. And so it's interesting that we've seen companies like Lemonade, I would say in the past year or two, um, companies emerge that um, are really kind of taking insurance and taking a new spin on insurance by adding, um, you know, more more customized offerings and a more digital experience. And I think um, Lemonade is a great example just in terms of the message they put out to consumers. Um, you know, it's easy to get insured, 90 seconds to get insured, um, easy to pay premiums, but also easy if you do file a claim and, and you're getting a claim payment, it's, it's very easy and quick to get paid. So, so they make a commitment that you get paid in three minutes. Um, so I think it's interesting when you look at them as a, as a, as a platform and a, a company, I mean, Ultimately, they, they could be a, a partner to some of the traditional insurance companies. They could be a competitor. So I think time will tell how these, these newer companies evolve. But it's, it's interesting that we're starting to see innovation. Um, and I think the insurance space is a, is a great example of that. Yeah, it, it is interesting. Like, like with a lot of digital-only businesses, they have the advantage of starting, you know, from scratch with yeah. modern technology. Um, and, and the legacy players, you know, d don't. And so they're trying to adapt existing systems to a new way of, uh, of, of doing business. So, so just taking that example and applying it to legacy businesses, what are they doing to try to keep pace with some of the lemonade-type businesses that are popping up around them? Um, I mean, I think they're, and they are looking at, um, I mean, especially when it comes to payments, they are looking at, at alternatives, right? A, a, a lot of claim payments are, are still made via check today, but, but the reality is, and, and, um, and we're hearing more and more about this, that insurance companies are looking, for example, for um, ways to make digital payouts to their their customers, right, when, when they do a claim payment. So I, I think I think they're moving in that direction. I think that companies like Lemonade are kind of almost, you know, setting a spark that's saying it's it's time, you know, making almost expediting the process a little bit. But I, I think they're aware, and, and it takes longer to embrace and, and change the processes that, that that they've been doing for so many years and decades. But I, I do think that a lot of companies are starting to take those steps, and, and some already have, and are doing pilots or are rolling out di different digital payout um, solutions. So, Tammy, one of the things that you mentioned when we were talking about um, uh, payment uh, via e-check and the willingness to switch, you talked about education and, uh, and, and property management-related use cases. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit more um, for us on, on those two things in, in particular. Yeah, so I, I think it's interesting, and I, I mean, these are, again, just a couple of examples of industries, but when you think about things like tuition payments or rent payments or maintenance payments, they tend to be higher dollar value payments. And so a lot of times because, I mean, they're higher dollar value, they can be recurring, which means if you think about um, cards as a way to make those payments, it can be, in some cases cost prohibitive, right, from a, from a business or institution perspective to, to accept card. Um, you know, if it's thousands of dollars that they're, they're coming in, the, the cost of, of the card can be pretty extensive. And so um, with that, um, you know, different payment alternatives, and, and that's kind of where I, I tied in eCheck before, having those different alternatives makes it um, easier, more compelling for them to accept digital payments. And I think What's interesting in these examples is, is we've actually seen a number of platforms that, that have emerged that are almost bringing a lot of these maybe more traditional companies that don't have a big digital presence, they're, they're bringing them into the digital space. So these are platforms that provide a lot of services. It could be marketing, it could be analytics, um, other management type services, but at the same time, payments is, is, a, is an important part of it. And so what we're seeing is that these platforms are, are coming in, especially in these, in these businesses that tend to be a little 
less digital and, and they're providing them an easy way to, to really come into the digital space. Mm -hmm. No, it's, uh, I, I, think it, I think it's interesting. And, and, you know, to our earlier point, um, if these businesses signaled that they accepted um, an alternative to a check, more of a digital opportunity, I'm sure that that 28% in, in thinking about um, paying rent or mortgage would probably would probably escalate. So sometimes you just need a nudge, a visual nudge. I think so. I agree. Uh, I, I I think so. So so when thinking about pulling all of this together, so now we know that there are a number of different methods and options for for businesses in thinking about. Um, enabling payment uh, and and actually sending payment, the rubber meets the road in actually getting getting it done. So, um, where are you guys on on helping businesses deal with that? Paul, do you want to take that? Yeah, sure, sure. So, so one of the things that we're we're, we're clear on is that companies, businesses, and consumers all want choices. Um, but as we discussed, they don't really want to manage all the friction that often comes with a lot of those choices. And so what we've done is created a series of products that, that help companies, that gives company choice of different ways to, to work with consumers uh, to move money quicker. And there's, you know, quicker, you know, what is quicker kind of depends on what you did before and where you want to go. But there's a lot of choices around faster. And, you know, we've talked about risk management already. We, we see it every day. As, as things move faster, potential fraud opportunities increase. We, 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 this is what we do all day long. And so, you know, we need to stay focused on that and we want our customers focused on it. And, you know, we also understand that the things they choose to do to get quicker, they need to be able to consume them and integrate them. You know, whether it's a <clears throat> they're running on a mainframe or whether they're on the most contemporary piece of architecture, They've got to be able to stitch in in a way that works for them. And so, you know, what we did is we, we created two different products here in the B to C or C to or C to B space. And when we jump over to the next slide, I'll kind of break them down. So if, if we start with consumers paying businesses digitally, the, 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 the digital payments SDK is a software development kit that has a series of APIs and widgets within it, which allows companies to collect from consumers using a variety of, of payment methods. Um, it, it, of course, includes the fraud and risk management that we've talked about, and it runs on all the internal applications that, that, that have the, the sort of scale that I've referred to with the 30 billion transactions, and it's fairly easy to stitch together. And w w what we found is if we, if we focus on the three things at the top, you know, easy to use, safe, and fast. That tends to resonate quite well with business customers who who want to collect fast, but they 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 want to have a series of options for their customers, and they want to be able to use these things in a in a safe and secure way. Mm -hmm. On on fifteen, oh, or if you you got a question, Karen? No, no, I, I was gonna. I'll save it. I'll save it till after you talk about about uh, about the next slide. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it. it if you look on the next slide, the disbursements product goes the other direction, so to speak. It is businesses delivering payments to consumers. And, you know, if, if you look at different use cases, this sort of a product is used in different ways. You know, in the gig economy, m m many freelancers are still paid with a check, believe it or not. And this, this product allows freelance organizations and gig economies to, to, to pay freelancers and those quicker. Or, you know, maybe it's a marketplace. Maybe you've sold something on your favorite marketplace and you wish to be paid uh, faster and, and securely. That's the kind of that's the kind of business case or, or use case, I should say, that digital disbursements focuses on. And there's a variety of rails. You know, we talked about the Now Network and how it sits on top of all those different rails. And it also includes the sort of fraud controls that, that are important. You know, when, when, when making a payment, you want to know who your counterparty is and you want to be paying the correct individual and you want to make sure that, you know, based on U.S. law and other regulations, you're even allowed to pay them. And so those are the things that we've incorporated into the disbursements product to, to help companies move money safely and securely and quickly to consumer receivers. So, so what, what, I'm sorry, what, do you have something else, Paul, before I ask my question? No, go ahead. 
you know, we, 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 so, so now we have the, the capabilities, and you know, this is a little bit of what Tammy and I have been bantering about throughout. Um, I, I think sometimes you, you've got all this available, but what you really need to do is to actually get, get the end user on, on board. And that isn't necessarily just about building it and they will come. But it's, I guess, thoughtful um, strategies about how to how to drive adoption. So I'd love to get your thoughts on 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 that because without it, um, it's not clear that it will get the ignition that everyone has just invested and hopes to get. You know, we I couldn't agree with you more, Karen. The when I think about adoption, you know, one of the examples that comes to mind is that. You know, for the for the folks on the phone, and many of us, if you grab your cell phone and you log into your bank to look at your bank balance, you are probably using a piece of Fiserv technology to do that. And 80 million people do that. They use their phone and Fiserv technology to interact with their bank, for example. And when we released those products years ago, Part of the reason why 80 million people use Fiserv products to do this is because of the adoption skills. You know, 80 million people don't do it simply because we built it and we hoped that they would come. We built it because we knew that, you know, us and our bank partners collectively knew that that kind of application was going to create a business advantage for the bank. It was going to create a tremendous opportunity for the consumer to do things faster with less friction. And we spent a ton of time learning about why do consumers adopt things, and then how can we help them do it? So that's how you get to 80 million people using their phone, checking their bank balance, or sending a payment, or making a bill payment through their phone. Um, it's things like that. And so for both of those products, the same team that has been driving adoption across so many payments and financial services applications over the last 30 years, that same team focuses on driving adoption for both of these business processes that manifest themselves in these services that we offer. So we get pretty excited about folks who say, you know what, I, I want to build it, but I want people to use it because then the adoption team can swing into action and can really help drive adoption using many of the assets and the knowledge that we've, that we've picked up over 30 years of doing that. I, I know that, you know, all of this um, is, is very focused on, you know, the, the bank's customer base and what they're trying to achieve. And, and so it's not fair to say, you know, what, what works. But is there a common thread that over your many years of working with banks um, to get adoption of new technologies uh, that, that you would say at all costs, you have to do this one thing, otherwise it will fail. Is there something come to mind? Yeah, then there's probably more than one thing because we've, we've, we've taken those capabilities and we have repurposed them direct to the, to the corporate and the business space. And in the corporate and the business space, there's a couple things you find. The first one is most people in corporate, in the corporate side, don't really know how to do this. You know, they haven't done it before. You know, these are the kind of products they will choose to buy and install one time in their career. And so, you know, it takes them longer to rally up research. It takes them longer to make decisions. When they make decisions, they're not necessarily based on 30 years of data. And so really the, the one thing here is that as you go forth and you begin to, to go faster and offer more to your consumers, we really think there's an advantage of, of, of having someone guide you down that path who has already done it a bunch of times, made a bunch of mistakes, and had a bunch of successes. Um, to, to keep our business customers out of the ditch on this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, the, the, the one thing, though, um, that I'm curious about, again, we use the term faster almost as a default description of what, of what we all want out of, out of a, a digital um, disbursement or um, collecting payments option. And no one's ever really defined faster. What does faster mean when you talk to your FI partners and they think about it in terms of their of their end user? Is it is it one definition of faster, or does it vary by use case? You know, we spend a ton of time talking with 
businesses who are either sending to a consumer or receiving from a consumer about that very topic. And, you know, faster than what? You know, faster than how it's paid today or faster than, than the way the consumer gets it today but how they want it. Um, and, and, you know, really faster to who? The sender or the receiver. Right. And I, I, what we see in this is that different use cases have different definitions of faster. And it's, it's almost a misleading term because it, you know, faster in the gig economy is probably very different than faster in the, re, you know, companies that send out rebates when you buy certain products. It's, right. you know, it, it's one word, but it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Yep, yep. So I think this is a maybe a good segue to the last couple of, of thoughts here as, you know, as everyone listening and just everyone in general is, is contemplating what to do with all of these various options that are that are swirling around in terms of alternative networks, rails, methods. Um, where do you start? How do you help your partners think about what what to do, what what steps to take, and in what order? Yeah, and I uh, I can start with this. So yeah, I mean I think there's there's a number of of things that that companies need to think about and consider as they're as they're making these decisions. Um, one is really the, just the ease of integrating these different capabilities. So there was the question earlier about um, APIs and how easy is it to access these different services? How easy is it to add on additional services? Whether it's money movement or risk management, I think I think that. How, how easy that is, as well as how the costs associated with maintaining that, I think is one really important consideration as, as a company is making a decision on this. Um, another is, I, I would say it's innovation, but it's also um, what offerings are available today, right, and what offerings can you expect in the future. So we've talked about faster payments. We've talked about um, flexible payment methods, right? So some people might prefer to pay via e-check, some people might prefer to pay via debit card. So that can vary. And, and it's really a consumer preference as well as a business preference, right, in terms of what they want to offer. But I think as a company is deciding what digital payment services they want to offer, making sure that they pick a provider that can meet the needs they have today and they can also depend on as their needs evolve, I think is really important. Um, Another item around support, things like, um, you know, is from a technical perspective, from an operational perspective, Paul just gave some good information in terms of consumer adoption. Um, what kind of support can can you count on from from your partner? And um, as your needs grow or as your needs evolve, um, is that partner able to to grow and evolve with you? Uh, and then an, another key one is, is really, and I know we've talked about this a bit too, but it's around security and, and risk management. So we talked earlier about there's a lot of regulatory and compliance considerations that are involved when, when money is moved. At the same time, there's a lot of risk management and fraud considerations. So things like, is the person the right person, right? Is the person authenticated and the right person to, to be transacting? Um, is the account they're using the right account? I think. Um, looking at a partner, looking at what tools they have, what processes they have, how they leverage analytics to really solve for some of these things, I think is also another really important consideration. You know, I, I think as we talk about the, um, you know, the why this matters, I, I think we've done a good job of talking about why it does. Um, but I also think that, you know, unlike conversations of, you know, several years ago, there's now you know, there's now the possibility of actually making it faster, and and I think that's where um, a lot of the a lot of the difference now in these conversations um, is, is 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 happening because it it can be it can be done as opposed to something that maybe could be done at some point at some point down the road. I don't know, Tammy, whether you you agree or disagree. I, I, I definitely agree. A lot of the, um, there was, uh, Paul talked a little bit about this earlier, but all of, all of the different players that we're seeing in, in this, um, in this environment, right? So there's, um, the card networks and, and TCH and EWS and 
there's a lot of momentum out there right now. And I would say when you look at card rails, and we've talked a lot about disbursement, um, right now there's near ubiquity where almost every debit card, at least in the U.S., can receive an instant credit. Um, that didn't exist, um, you know, a year, two years ago. Um, same with if you look at ACH and same-day ACH. The, the mandates around that are, are very recent, um, starting last year, going into this year. So it's it, there's a lot of momentum that's happened in the past 12 to 24 months. And so with that, I think there, there's a mix of the rails are, are now almost finally there, right, or, or they're, they're, they're continuing to evolve. I won't say they were there, but, but they've made so much progress. Um, and at the same time, consumers, because of that, have different expectations. So we talked about with person-to-person -person payment, um, there is an expectation now that if someone that you know is paying you money, you should be able to get it um, in real time or in real time. Um, consumers pay businesses in, in, in near real time, and so they expect that businesses can pay them back in real time. So I think there's this mix of the technology's advanced, consumer expectations have advanced, and so that's really driving the need for, for businesses to really, um, you know, make the right investments to, to, to address their, their, their customers' expectations. So um, there's a question that's come in, and, and, uh, and Tammy and Paul, I'd love for you to, to address this. So it's, um, it's about blockchain technology, um, specifically related to faster payments. Um, where do you see that fitting, if, if, if at all? Is that on your roadmap? What are you hearing from um, your partners, uh, the banks, and the businesses they uh, they interact with. Yeah, okay, so Paul, I'll take a, oh, go. Oh, go ahead. So, um, okay, okay, so I can start, and then Paul, I'll, or do you want to start, or? <laughs> go for so it. You go. You go. Okay. All right, I'll go. So, so I mean, I think, I mean, there, there's obviously been a lot of advancements, advancements in blockchain. I mean, I will say that within Fiserv, it's something that we're exploring and testing. I think a lot of banks have a lot of initiatives around blockchain. Um, some companies are... Um, you know, when it comes to Bitcoin or accepting, you know, uh, Bitcoin as a currency. So there is some advancements. I would say that in the products that we're currently talking about in terms of business to consumer disbursements and, and consumer to business payments, um, we're not seeing, it's something that we're definitely keeping an eye on, um, but it's not something that we're currently offering within our mix of products. Paul, do you have anything to add? I don't. That was that was wonderful. It was a wonderful thing, and I I, I, was going to choke. I was going to choke if you said you were enabling Bitcoin payments, but I didn't have to choke, so that's good. Um, that's a, I think it's an area that you know blockchain technology is is an area of experimentation, and um, a lot of a lot of banks are dabbling, um, but it's still very early days, and I think I think there's a lot that goes in a lot that goes into it, and particularly. Uh, getting it to work at scale, and I think that's when you're talking about moving money. Scale is really important, and uh, that's a uh, you know that that's something that is a is an area TBD with respect to what we're seeing around blockchain technology. But but interesting nonetheless. Um, Paul, do you want to do you want to wrap it up for us um, and give us sort of final final thoughts on 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 what needs to be contemplated as everyone listening and later everyone listening to the playback of this needs to take on board as they contemplate digital disbursements and payments and taking those first steps. You know, I'll, I'll take a run at it and then I'll let Tammy, uh, Tammy finish behind me here. So I, I, I think maybe we should start where we, or finish where we started that, you know, the definition of faster is, is, is not a single definition. and Companies have become keenly focused on on what will drive their business case and what will make their customers happier, and and how can payments in their various forms be used to to improve the the consumer experience as well as the business model of the of the of the corporate customer here, and that's that's what we have taken 30 years and and, and a significant amount of resource and capability to to focus on is. How to, how to improve that interaction 
through the movement of money that uh, that brings those parties closer together and, uh, and creates an advantage for everybody. Sammy, I mean, you, you have the final word. Yeah, no, I, I think Paul did a, a great job of, um, of wrapping up. But, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that um, we've seen, I mean, I, I think what we talked about uh, just previously in terms of there's, there is so much momentum there. I think it's a great opportunity for businesses right now to, if they haven't already, to start to look at ways to um, add or enhance the digital payments offerings that they have. Um, obviously, we would welcome the opportunity to, to help in any way that we can. Uh, but uh, I think I would leave it on that note. Yeah, I mean, I, I think as, I, as I'm thinking about the the couple things that, that I was that I was left with. I think you know optionality is really important, um, and I think the ability to provide that on both the sender and the receiver side is is really important and not to be and not to be underestimated. So I think you know options that provide that optionality um, for for banks and corporates I think is is, is really important. I, I also think you know, don't assume that build it and they will come. I think there's a lot of work that's, that's really behind getting, um, getting consumers to get on board. And I, I think the ability to have, you know, those, those best practices and learnings is extremely important for getting, you know, for getting the flywheel started, to, not to use such a cliche um, analogy, but I, I, think that's, I think that's really important. And I, and I think this, this notion of, you know, what does faster really mean, um, I think, is, is an area to examine. I don't think we give it enough, um, enough airtime, but I think it's, it's, it's critically important to consider as, um, as banks and corporates are thinking about optionality and ways to adopt, um, really what problem are you trying to solve and how fast is required. Digital is where we're going. Um, but 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 faster, I think, is something that needs to be defined in the eye of the of the sender and the receiver and the use case they're satisfying. So that, that's kind of where I I came out on on things, and I thought it was a, a really interesting and fascinating hour of conversation. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Karen. Nice to talk to you. Thank you. Nice nice talking to you guys as well, and thank you all for giving us your precious time today. We really enjoyed having you as part of our conversation. Thanks for your great questions. And have a great rest of the day and a great, good rest of the week. We'll have the playback of this and a write-up of our discussion on payments.com in the next couple of days. Thanks again. Bye-bye now.